How are you today? Hey, hey, Gabby. I'm doing great. Excited about this conversation. Yeah, me too. It's like save the best till last, as it were. <laughs> Buttering you up already. <laughs> Tell me your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm really delighted to have you on because obviously we've, well, not obviously, but for those who are watching, we have met before on a couple of occasions. Yeah. Uh, I've had some really interesting conversations with you. I think you're a really interesting person with a oh, very unique story, background and journey. Um, you kind of have had sort of a similar little kind of journey to me. We've gone off in slightly different paths. Tangents, yes. Yeah, but there are some commonalities there, which yep. I think are really interesting. And I think it'd be nice for our listeners to also hear from somebody else who also specializes in kind of the DEI space, change management and like leadership development and things yep. like that. So we'd definitely touch on a bit of that. But let's start off by you introducing yourself to our audience and just maybe just give us a little bit of an outline of your journey. And then I will pick up the bits that I think I want to expand on. Wow. Um, <laughs> it's a long journey, you know, Gabby. I know. Uh, <laughs> We've only got 45 we'll, minutes. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I don't think we'll have enough time to do that, but to go through the journey. But um, yeah, but I'm Romeo. I'm, so I'm the, the, the founder and um, CEO of, of Lumerous. Lumerous is a social impact management consultancy. And um, we work with organizations around driving better corporate governance um, in their business. Um, also around what we call organizational health, which mm. includes, um, you know, leadership. It also includes the whole notion of inclusion and belonging, as, as we refer to it. And we also work a lot with clients in the ESG space, especially around the S in terms of driving social value and social impact um, in the wider society that they work in. Um, yeah, and you know, so that that's that that's like the the full time day job. Um, I'm also chair of the UK's second largest HIV charity, mm -hmm. and I'm also a trustee on um, a, a number of other um, um, charities, including Youth Business International and um, um, the O'Brien Dennis Initiative, among others. So yeah. Amazing. Thank you for sharing what you're doing now. And let's take a yeah. leap back. Yeah. And start a little bit from where you kind of grew up and what you were doing kind of back then when you were kind yeah. of a oh, teenager, what influenced you and kind of bring you back up to date. I'm, I'm, I'm a country boy from, from Jamaica, right? <laughs> so I, I grew up in, uh, in a village, in a small village in St. Mary. Jamaica, St. Mary's the northern, yes, you're from St. Mary's, right, Gabby, yeah. the northern part of, of, of the island of Jamaica. I grew up in a in a little farming village called Barclay Town. Um, lots of people would also know it as Lucky Hill. It's, it's kind of a bordering community. And, um, you know, I went to school there. My my mom was a school teacher. She, you know, she, she taught at the local uh, primary and, and high school there as well. Um, my background is I'm, I'm mixed. I am Jamaican Cuban. My dad has um, strong Cuban heritage and he has actually used to live and, and work there for a while. Um, yeah, so, you know, grew up in a, in, in a, in, in a, in a small village. Um, had real was really influenced by both my mother and my grandmother because my dad died at a really young age. Uh, I yeah, that. Age Me of, too. We've never mentioned that. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad never. died when I was nine, nine, and being the eldest son, I had to grow up pretty fast to mm. help to kind of um, help my my mother and my grandmother with my siblings. So you know, we um, not to pull out the old trope, but you know. You got strong Jamaican women going on. I know that oh, was definitely absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And you know what? I think I, I when my dad died, I was really very upset because we were very close, right? Mm. Um, but you know, in looking back now, I'm really happy that that happened. You know, the universe has a way of just doing things mm. because I, if my dad was alive, I would not be the man that I am now, right? right. Because my dad, you know, when my dad died, we lost everything. You know, he was a great provider. You know, he was, um, you know, a man, he used to work in the bauxite industry. You know, we were living pretty comfortable, you know, lives. And then when my dad died, all of that got uprooted. My mom, we lost everything, the house, everything. So I had to then move into my grandmother's um, little attached house 
with a toilet outside it's a hole in the ground had to go to the river and catch water and tie goats and all that kind of stuff because my mom had to then move to the city to, to get a much better paying job mm. and all of that i think helped to build um character helped to build my integrity so you know my my, my grandmother was extremely spiritual but not not a fanatic christian but very spiritual you know she believed in a higher power she believed in the universe mm. you know she has such strong faith and i think yeah, that get on very well then in that case i'm all about that but yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and that helped to shape me in terms of how i view a lot of things and then my mother on the other hand was was very structured you know she she worked and she you know she would make sure every friday she came up she helped to make sure she did the laundry and helped the cleaning and all of that and then sunday evening she would go back and then she'd do her work stuff and you know so i learned that level of discipline and organization from her right mm -hmm. and you know i'm not afraid to say that my bias especially when it comes on to hiring people is my bias is towards women like because i feel that mm. anything you want to get done just give it to a woman and trust me it is going to be done right <laughs> and, and I, i've seen that happen so many times and and also like in my whole career most of my mentors most of the my sponsors most of the people who have opened doors for me in corporate to move up and to progress and to to be better in myself have been women you know i would say 90 percent of them have been women and has it been um, women from, yeah. from different backgrounds has it been women from similar backgrounds to yourself has it been a no bit? women from 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 different backgrounds um you okay. know for example i i became a I became a senior exec at the age of 25 wow. um, in Jamaica, right? I was director of operations for, for an airline. And it was a female who actually mentored and, and helped me to progress into that role, wow. right? Um, even here, when I came to the UK, I remember after completing my, my master's program and decided I was going to stay in the UK and I started looking for a job. Man, I sent CVs like crazy, like oh, almost 200 plus applications. And I remember this headhunter, a, a, a white female headhunter. Um, she was based up north and she came down to London. She met with me and she's like, look, I think I have an idea why you are not you know hitting the mark because i would get to first the first interviews and yeah. then um i would progress after that and she gave me a very profound uh, piece of advice she said to me do me a favor she says go down to boots and buy the 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 the, the um the least strong the lowest um strength reading glasses that you can get right she says do you have a gray suit i said yes she said, you have white shirts? I said, yes. She says, the next time you go to an interview, wear your gray suit, a white shirt, a plain tie, a plain shoes, no plain colored socks, no rings on your finger, and a simple watch, right? What were you and wearing she, in the first place? That's what I want to know. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I don't think I was wearing anything different, but I think what made the, the significant difference was so, you know, maybe the tie, because, you know, my tie would probably be a little bit more flamboyant in terms of colors, so and so. Mm. But but when I did this, I actually went, and that's how I ended up getting my, my first job in this country at Accenture, right? Interesting. Yes. And and it wasn't until a few months after she's, I said to her, what, what do you think the difference was? She says, Romeo, I had to make sure you disarm yourself. And I'm like, disarm? What do you mean? Oh. She says that you need to understand that you are a six foot black man built mm. with muscles, super qualified. You're walking in. People are going to feel intimidated. Mm. They're going to feel threatened. And therefore, you know, that energy, it, they're not going to progress you based off that. And she said the glasses and the way how you are dressed completely disarms them because when they see someone walking in wearing glasses, first thing comes to mind is they're a nerd. They're not, they're not, they're non-threatening. And so, oh, okay, all right, this one is going to just be, you know, a, a, one of those atypical mm. black person that just 
don't push the boundaries and just just sit and keep quiet you know um little did they know yeah so so yeah women have always been um really very instrumental in my growth yeah, even today in in my business that's that's beautiful to hear actually beautiful to know um i guess what i'm quite interested in is like how did you end up choosing the jobs or the roles that you went for what made you want to work for those particular companies or in those particular roles do you think yeah yeah good 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 question um i i, I think i had some some um some really god just put some really interesting people in my life over the years so um when i left high school my very first job at 16 was working for a guy called Lothrop Fuller Duncan. He was the, I think, 47th richest man in America at that time. Ooh. And he had quite a number of interesting um, investments in Jamaica. One of them was a premix um, concrete business, which I used to I used to um, work for. But apart from being, you know, the, the, the trainee sales clerk in that operation, I was also, he took me under his wing almost as, is go for right so i would go to his apartment i would make sure it's clean before he arrives in jamaica mm -hmm. i would drive his car to the airport and pick him up without a driver's license right <laughs> Standard. <laughs> uh, i had the opportunity of going out on his yacht with him you know to do marlin fishing and all of that and, and during those um times you know we had some really good conversations and i remember once he said to me you know um what is it that you you know what's your ambition what is it that you'd like to grow up to be and i, I remember saying to him look i I'd, I'd really love to to own my own business like you right um and you know he gave me some really good advice he's like look before you do that you know make sure that you build certain skills you know all of that and and so my whole process of building um you know building the skills were and i didn't know this at the time mm. was um I, I think I had that in the back of my mind because the, the next job after that was working in the airline industry, right? As yeah. a reservation agent. And I remember when I joined, I distinctly said to myself that I'm going to become a supervisor within a year. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of pitched, picked out, how do I make this happen? And I saw saw the clear path and I just I just went for it and I did it. And within a year, I was I was a supervisor, right? You know what? I'm going to jump in very very quickly there because I think there's something that's really important about you kind of being this um, this guy's almost personal assistant, as it were, because it kind of and I think it's very clever. If you meant to do it or not, I don't know, but it opened you up to what possibilities they were and gave you experience oh. firsthand. So it wasn't just oh I know if I'm rich I can have a boat and go marlin fishing. You were doing it. You were living it. You were watching the way he was dealing with people, the way he was conducting his business. And you're Absolutely. Like, oh, this is what I can do. This Absolutely. I think that's Absolutely. incredibly important because I had a similar experience which opened my eyes up to being more ambitious and what is achievable, you know? You know what? Completely agree with you because especially growing up in, in the village, right? Mm -hmm you're not exposed to these kinds of stuff, right? You're exposed to a certain level, right? Mm -hmm. And and even, even just like working with this guy and hearing the conversations he was having with his friends while we were at, you know, at his home or out on the yacht and hear them talking about millions and the investments. And, and every time I heard something, a certain word would stick in my head and I would go home and I would research and I'd start reading up. So indirectly, he was mentoring me, right? Yeah. He was mentoring me because he kind of he kind of just opened my eyes a little wider to what was possible right and it yes. was from there that i decided that oh i don't have to be a farmer i don't have to be uh, a, an accounting clerk or a storeroom clerk there's there's far greater things for me to really um push towards and i think that's where you know a lot of my my, my push has has come from and yeah. I, I don't think yeah, that no, I... my, my my career journey has been, you know, straightforward. So I've dabbled into corporate and then into 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 entrepreneurship, right? So, you know, um, you know, while I was working at the airline industry, a group of us started and grew one of the largest event management companies in the Caribbean, right? You know, we've worked with people like um, LL Cool J, Mary J. Blige. 
um, R. Kelly, Luther Vandross, you know, Cedric the Entertainer, you know, lots of these guys. We have held large concerts with like tens of thousands of people, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we have delved into um, film production and um, and manage artists and and all of that. So you know, there was a double a double in and out there. When I left corporate, I started my own transportation business. So, you know, had a fleet of trucks that used to deliver goods. And we had like um, about 20 um, luxury cars that we used to um, bring diplomats around, you know, all that kind of stuff. Wow. Um, Such different pieces there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you think you were kind of just searching and waiting for, like trying things and waiting for the right thing to drop and go, ah, this is it. No, yeah. just trying things out as you went along. Abs absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And it's and it, the opportunities just kind of I just spotted the opportunities and I just kind of went for it. So for example, when I when I started the the VIP car service, um, it was when I was at university doing my uh, um, this was years after, like in my early mid twenties when I was actually um when I was actually at university and was struggling in terms of um, you know, I was doing my first degree. I did have uh, one first degree in international relations. Um, yeah, this was like 22, 23, yeah. And um, I was struggling to pay my tuition. Mm. Uh, but I recognized that the university used to used to bring in a lot of, um, because the, the universe, universe of the West Indies is spread across the islands of, right. of, 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 of the Caribbean. So lectures tend to move around, right? And this particular course was being done in conjunction with uh, uh, a, a university from America. And so they used to fly the professors in to kind of, you know, lecture us. And then, you know, yeah. a week later they would fly back out, that kind of stuff. And I, having worked at the airport, I knew how much the, the taxes at the airport were charging them to bring the professors in. So I went in to see the pro vice chancellor and I'm like, look, I can save you you know, 30% on your transportation cost, right? Yeah. And he says, how? And I says, you know, if you give me the contract to pick up all your professors coming in, this is what I'm, I will charge you. This is what you're paying. Yeah. I said, plus, on top of that, I will give them top-notch VIP treatment because I had an airport badge. So I'm like, I will meet them at the air at the air at the foot of the airport, the air, the airline. I yeah. will rush them through immigration and customs because I knew everyone there, right? <laughs> Love yeah, this. yeah, and I also knew the hotels that they were staying, and I'm like, I will get them pre-checked in, you know, get them upgrade everything, boom. And I said, look, this yes. is the way how I can solve my tuition issue. I'm like, so for every invoice that I give you, you take fifty percent of it towards my tuition, yeah. and the other fifty percent you give to me. Fantastic. This time, I didn't have a car. I didn't have <laughs> any kind of vehicle to do this. But they gave me a contract. And then after that, I took the contract to a car dealership. And I'm like, I have this contract from the university. Everyone knows this university. Government runs and everyone knows that this contract is legit. And I'm like, I need a car to execute this. And yeah. it's funny, that the guy there was, you know, he had fated me. You know, my very first car was a, a, a Toyota Camry right one of those top end luxury ones right. you probably don't even, no, even no. know that kind of car oh, right no, no, no. yeah and and so the business you know and when we picked up the, the people when i picked them up it wasn't just taking them to the hotel and back it would be like okay so what's your plans for the weekend oh okay you'd like to go and so okay we can take you there you know and then we started creating this thing where we would then take them to the real jamaica so we wouldn't take them to the tourist spots we would yeah. take them to into the the real community so they can experience it and yeah. then you know they would go back and tell their other people and other people eventually we ended up getting contracts with the embassies uh you know the, the different companies all and it, and it just grew from there right so it's just kind it's of like just every spotting. problem can be solved so you oh, have absolutely. Like, right how am i going to get through this how am i going to be this right how am i going to get the cars yeah, and you worked out. It's just like they all would tackle with one problem at a time, then move on to the next day. Absolutely. Don't think about all the problems that you're going to have to work yep. with in one yep. go. Because that's just yep. going to paralyze you, right? Yep. Deal with yep. the one immediately in front of you, and then the next one will reveal itself, and you can deal with that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, I, and you know what? I learned that from my grandmother because she was a she was a seamstress. 
Mm. And I and I used to see how she used to kind of she was one of the best seamstress in, in, in Jamaica. Like she used to make these it, it wasn't until I came to the UK I knew the word was uh, what port decor or couture. Oh, couture, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's it. Because she used to work, make these amazing wedding dresses and ball gowns. You wow. know, I, I can embroidery, I can crochet because I used to do the embroidery and stuff to put on these dresses, right? Wow. Yeah, yeah. And so, and, and I remember having a conversation with her, like, um, you know, I, I remember seeing one of these wedding dresses. I'm like, wow, this is great. And I'm like, um, I didn't realize that this is how it would come out at the beginning. And she says, all you have to do is to have a vision in terms of in terms of what you want it to be like. And you just mm. do it piece by piece. That's all she said. She said, you do it piece by piece. And so for me, even now, that's how I approach every single thing. Like I, I can walk into a room that's completely messy and I just you know, no, okay, put that there, put that there, put that there, put that there. You know, with my clients, that's what they love. Like they come with me with a million different issues and I'm, and right away I can say, okay, this is what we're going to pick up first. Then we're going to do this. Then we're going to, and just put it in some kind of a logical flow, right? In terms of, in terms of how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. I love yeah. that because sometimes people get paralyzed of where to start because it's so oh, yeah places that they can start from i love that messy room analogy you look at it going oh my gosh where do i start all you have to do is pick up that first thing and then you're yes. working out so it's a great analogy okay so you kind of led us quite nicely into coming towards what you're doing now in the present day so i guess what i'd like to understand is how you and you've kind of touched upon it a little bit there how you support the companies organizations that you work with with their change kind of management yeah. and all the other amazing things that you explained to us at the beginning and so I love that element of helping them problem solve. What else yeah. is unique that you bring to the table? So, so I, I, I think just a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit more before we jump there. So yeah, cool. my whole journey into this space started also by accident because, you know, having coming from Jamaica, which is a predominantly, um, you know, the motto of Jamaica is out of many one people, right? So you have black people, you have white people, you have Indian, you have Chinese, you have every single denomination you can think of and and color and creed, right? So for us in Jamaica, like racism just didn't exist because like we just know that, oh, that man is a white Jamaican. He's probably yeah. from, from Westmoreland. And the reason why he is, he's white, he's lighter in color than us is because a large group of Germans and Scottish settled in in, in West Berlin and their ancestry has continued, right? Or oh, that yeah. man is is an Indian, right? Or yeah. is a Chinaman because they all came to Jamaica, right? Yeah. Um, so so I didn't know what that looked like. It wasn't until I came here in the UK that someone pointed out that the way how I was being treated and the way how things were said to me in, in the workplace was racist. And because I thought that people were just being rude. So rude. I just tell them off. Like, I was like, you can't talk to me like that. How dare you? You know? Oh, you know, okay. I just tell them off and just move on. And it was not, yeah, it was not until someone pointed out to me. And at that point, even when they pointed out to me, I'm like, that is not my problem. That's their problem. If, if they won't have a problem with me and the color of my skin, I can't change this. And I would not want to change this color, right? You know, it's either you accept me as I am or you know you you you, you suffer because i'm not taking on your baggage like why yeah. should i do that right so even when i was at, i remember joining accenture you know being the 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 most the most senior black person in my offering at that time mm -hmm. right and and then also but also seeing other black people and other people from an ethnic background who were there who were much, lo much longer than i have been and they were still below a certain level like yeah. within six months of me joining Accenture I was promoted and right. people were there for like 10 years and didn't and I'm like what's going on you know mm -hmm. and I keep hearing about this this glass ceiling mm -hmm. and I'm like if there's a glass ceiling them have sledgehammers just go put a sledgehammer and just shut it right like 
you know. Hang on a minute, hang on a minute. It's not that easy because people look to you then, Romeo, particularly leaders or people in boards or whatever, they'll go, but look at Romeo. He's managed to get to where he got to. There's no issues with the brown ceiling or whatever. If people are talented enough and work hard enough, they'll get there. So you are that person that they hold up to say, look, see, we're not racist. We're not racist. True, true, true. True, true, true. And and, and I actually became became one of the poster boys, um, you know, one of the token poster persons, you know, for many companies that I've worked for. Did you? And, and, and that is true. And I think I have one advantage I, I, over a lot of, especially people from an ethnic background that were born in this country. I okay. think my advantage is being born and, and brought up in a, in, a, in a culture and in an environment where you are not told that you need to um, stay in your lane or you have to be stay in your station right mm. yeah I, you know even at primary school if i told my teacher i wanted to become a fireman that nothing is wrong with becoming a fireman but to mm. her you don't have no ambition you need yeah, to be right. aiming much higher than that like you know you need to be saying lawyer doctor pilot that kind of stuff right yeah. and, and and it's and i and now when i look back it's not that they were saying anything was wrong with being a teacher or a policeman or a fireman it's like you know you've got to aim higher right mm. you know like my mother i remember coming home from school once and um yeah i forgot how the conversation went but i was saying to her oh you know teacher said you must aim for the clouds and she just slapped me across it and she says never aim for the clouds i'm like what do you mean she says never aim for the clouds aim for the sky because if you miss the sky, you will fall on a cloud. If you aim for the cloud and you miss it, you fall back down to the ground, right? Yeah, like yeah. you know. So I, I think that's the kind of mentality, you know. And I think that's the this that's the advantage that I have, and others who have not been born in this country have over those who were born here. Because I have a lot of friends who were born here, and some of the stories you hear, like a friend of mine wanted to become a barrister, and his teacher told him that, no, no, there, you need to go down to the local hotel and be trained to become a concierge. Like, why why do that to a child, you yeah. know? You know, he, he, you know, he, he, um, he shattered that because he's now a barrister, but, yes. and, and I'm seeing it, the nuances around, you know, where people are saying, you know, they don't sometimes say it directly. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's the microaggressions and the micro incivilities that you can pick up on where they're saying yes. to you, oh, know your place yeah. you know oh know your station like you know this you is know the what? level this is sorry to interrupt you this is reminded me of somebody so oh I've, can i be i need to be careful okay this is fine so i was working with somebody i hired somebody um recently and they informed me that um and they're currently studying mm, yeah no i'm not gonna say that either but basically they were studying um for a master's and um, they said that the, their experience of studying on this master's is that the lecturers don't let students from other countries answer questions as much. So if they put their hands up to ask a question or even to answer, respond to a question, that they're bypassed and then usually a yeah. white student is picked. And I'm not saying that it's deliberate at all. It's probably the lecturer feeling uncomfortable or unsure that they're maybe not going to understand, maybe perhaps yeah. there's an accent or, yeah. or, yeah. or actual unconscious bias or actual bias and yep. i was like damn you've paid all this money to come to yep. the uk study on a master's and you're not even getting the same teaching experience and that happens in yep. classrooms and universities across the country right yep. yeah that blew my oh, mind absolutely it happens oh, now like seriously it happens in university it happens in the place of work like yeah, even now me as a business owner like my chief of staff is a is a white french guy and mm-hmm. i remember going into a meeting um with with a with with a with with a client and they were actually having the conversation with him and not with me right wow. because obviously they're thinking that okay this black man could never be the boss right and he's such an amazing individual right you know he listened and then he would then say okay i have to check with romeo you know to see what's happening right and right away you could see where they were like oh like you know what I mean? Suddenly yeah. you're in the room again. Yeah, <laughs> oh, all yeah. Sudden, yeah all of a sudden I'm, I'm, I'm in the room again. But coming back to the, you know, the question you asked in terms of what kind of driven me to do that, it's mm. it, it was seeing these kind of things happening over and over with companies that I've worked with. Yeah. And every time I move to a company, I'm usually the only, right? 
the only black person on the board, the only black person in senior leadership, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm always saying, I am tired of being the only. It's heavy up here. Like I yeah. need some more people to help me carry this weight, right? So I would make sure that I find them and I mentor them and I I tell them what they need to do in terms of in terms of making it because like yeah, performance is one thing, but it's also how do you network? How do you how do you find the right sponsors so that they can speak up for you when you're in the room? You know, how can you make sure that the up you get exposed to the leadership so that the opportunities open up to you, right? Because yeah. it's a game, you know, in, in corporate, to progress in corporate is a game. And you yeah. have to decide, do I want to play this game or not, right? And if, if this is where you want to succeed, you got to learn how to play the bloody game, right? That's life though, isn't it? Life, you yeah, have to play the game. Of course, of course. You know, I, I, mean, I, I wrote a book about this, which became a number one bestseller as well, Enthusiasm Unchained. You know how 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 people from a from a black perspective can actually gain their success in in corporate. We'll and that's, sure that's one. A link to where they can get that in the uh, in the notes for this episode. Okay, thanks thanks for that. But then also on the other side, I I remember becoming um, director of supply chain for a, a large facilities management company. I had about nine hundred million on the spend, and I was also special projects manager. And I recognize also that. That company, like 60% of the employees were from an ethnic background. However, we were just spending with larger companies. We weren't spending with SMEs. We weren't spending with, with ethnic owned businesses. And I'm like, no man, something's wrong with this. Like we've got to also not only work on the career progression part, but how are we ensuring that as a business, we are using the power that we have, which is our spending power to yeah. drive economic um, empowerment and social impact, right? So I designed a program around incorporating diverse suppliers in the supply chain, ran that program for an entire year, um, found uh, over 270 um, diverse suppliers, um, wow. mentored them, developed them for an entire year. And then at the end of it, we ended up spending, um, I think it was 150, 157 million with these suppliers. Some of them went on to mm -hmm. also get other work from councils and from some other businesses because the, yeah. the thing i found was that um you know smes are the lifeblood of, of the economy mm -hmm. but corporates make it so difficult for smes to do business with them with all of these barriers and boundaries so i just developed the program to kind of you know um de de demystify that and to break away some of some of those mm -hmm. and you know i ended up winning a number of awards for that program so wow. So wow, that's back, amazing, Romeo. That's yeah. just like a legacy, seriously. I, I, I mean, even the policy that the UK government has now around supply chain diversity, I helped um, wrote when Theresa May was 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 it was it was in power. So you know, when I left corporate, the whole idea was, you know, how how can I make even a much bigger impact? And you know, initially it started off by us forming a private equity firm to invest in these diverse businesses okay. um to help them grow you know so we would bring our expertise help them to structure bring yeah. some cash to help them to grow and to develop yeah um in 2015 i i suffered a brain aneurysm and wow um, my gosh there's so much stuff coming up that i thought i thought new year and all this new stuff is <laughs> coming out it's like wow i didn't know this at all yeah, Sorry to hear yeah. That. i mean let's see you're here now well but what yeah happened? I, I mean they told me that i died i mean the, the neurologist told me that the amount of red blood cells that they found in my spinal fluid i should not be alive so i lost mobility i lost sight i could hardly talk you know all of that they thought i would be a vegetable they even told me that if I survive this, I'll be a vegetable, right? Mm -hmm. Not wood. Obviously, God had a much bigger plan for my life. So here I am. I walk wow. out of that hospital nine weeks after nothing. Like everything came back to normal. Like oh miracle. Oh and and it was but it was just, it was during that time that I I started questioning myself, like, you know, if I died now, what would that legacy be? Like, how would I have left this place a much better place than I found it, right? Yeah, and it was in that hospital that I, a lot of what we do now with Lumerous just emerged. You know, the whole notion that um, I need to use the knowledge and skills that I know to help to, to drive change, mm -hmm. to help to make to make the world a better place to make sure that the people 
that exist in this planet and to come, you know, um, inherit something that is far better than what is here now, right? And so what I know is I know business inside out. I've worked in business all my life from a, from a teenager. I know every, where all the bodies are buried as far as business yeah. is concerned, right? Um, you know, and I, I studied it, you know, both in my master's and my first degree. Um, so I looked at that and I looked at, okay, what are the things that I'm really passionate about? And the things that I was passionate about is the whole thing about how businesses are run properly in terms of the governance, right? How do they ensure that, um, you know, the goods and services that they deliver value to all their stakeholders, right? Their customers, making sure that the goods and services that they deliver to their customers are making a difference in the lives of those who, who buy it. The people that work for them like are you creating an environment where people feel like i mean you spend most of your life at work you know <laughs> are you creating an environment where people feel like i want to get up out of bed and go to this place you know where i i'm going to be spending you know all this time on a daily basis right yeah um you know how do we deal with our suppliers to make sure that we're empowering them and making sure that they themselves are also empowering their employees and spending yes. money the right way, right? Yes. You know, how do we how do we work in our communities? Like, you know, are we really making sure that if we're a mining company, we leave the place in a in, in a in a way that the the community that uses those those facilities are not being damaged in terms of their health or you know you're not putting toxic things in the water, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, all of that kind of stuff. You know, are you actually, even like your charitable giving, how impactful is your charitable giving as a business? Are you making sure that the money that you give is is really delivering value or is it that you're just doing it for a tick box exercise, right? Exactly. And so, and so, yeah, and so that's, that's, that's what we're about. We're about the whole notion of, um, of saying to business, being good is better for business, full stop. Right. Yeah. And this is what I've been working on with some of my clients, particularly venues at the moment, on yeah. the procurement processes and supply chains, because we tend to look immediately in front of us like, well, OK, so we're going to try and work with uh, SMEs or more um, suppliers run by different diversity, different backgrounds, ethnicities, etc. That's but what you've mentioned there is what I try and bring into. I'm like, what then what's the next things? What do you then expect from your your new suppliers that you're working with, yeah. how are you going to support them? How are you yeah. going to support them to then impact the people, their employees, as you said? And then how is the work that they're doing going to impact and filter back into the community? This chain is oh, absolutely. It's a proper chain. It's not just the immediate, what, who do we get our services from and our products from? Okay, we're going to try and do a bit of diversity around that. It's such yeah. a bigger picture than that. So, I mean, we've, we've, done audits for, we've done audits for clients where we look at, okay, the tier one, okay, they're nice and shiny and glistening. And basically, when you look at the tier two, which are the suppliers that those tier one suppliers use, you see human trafficking, you see child labor, you see, you know, not yeah. paying right wages. You know, and you're like, I'm, I go back to the clients, it's like, you know, this is affecting you, right? Yeah. You know, this is affecting you because this, this product that you are buying to, to build your product, mm -hmm. it, it's tainted, right? Yeah. It's seriously tainted, right? So, so you're right. It, you have to take a, a view of, of the supply chain to make sure that, because th the thing is that um, businesses are now realizing that as a society, we're demanding it, right? Yes, we are. We're demanding social justice in all its form, right? Yeah. We, mm -hmm. We're demanding more diverse boards, more mm -hmm. diverse, um, um, you know, workforce. We're demanding equal pay. We're demanding better protection of our planet in terms of the, the, the environment. We're demanding it. We are. Um, shareholders are demanding it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, as well, right? So, and also internally in businesses, um, the workforce are also demanding and pushing it, right? Exactly. So this is not, this is not a, a question Walls of- Walls are closing in. <laughs> of course, of course. So there's not, this is not a question of, should I do this or should I not? This is a mm. question of survival. If you don't do this, you ain't gonna be around. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't gonna be around right you ain't yeah. gonna be around you know yeah. and and even like you know when we work with, with clients and a lot of clients especially in the dni space they talk yeah. about oh gender diversity gender diversity i'm like really i'm like okay all right 
I, I'm like, okay, okay. All right, you want to focus on gender diversity. All right, let's go there. Let's go to gender diversity. What do you mean by gender diversity? Do you only mean white middle-class women who goes to Oxbridge, who is your mate's wife or your mate's daughter? Is that what you're talking about? Because to be, to be completely honest with you, when you talk about gen, when you look at gender diversity right now, that's what it's all about. It's not about the ethnic woman. It's not about the LB woman. It's not about the um the disabled woman. It's no. not about woman, the white woman from working class background. It is not. Exactly. It's not. Exactly. <laughs> this is what I have to put up on like the intersectionality. So, okay, we, we want to focus on women. So how are we going to focus, as you just said, on women from ethnic backgrounds? It's, it's exactly. Because, people because go, women don't just make yeah. up one set of people, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting isn't it that that is still going on but i see it with speaker panels as well and obviously you're one of the diverse speaker bureau speakers as well yeah. but you see it with speaker panels and people are looking very very pleased with themselves going oh look at the diversity of our panel and you literally just see okay you might see a 50 50 even split of men and women but as you said yeah. it's a white middle class women yeah, all white. an asian woman thrown in there perhaps yeah yeah um, and i'm like mm, yeah <clears throat> Exactly, 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 sorry, exactly, okay. right? Well, you, you've got to have the perspective. Like you, oh, sorry, go ahead, Romeo. No, I was just saying you have to have the perspective. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you do, exactly. Okay, so what are some of the biggest challenges then that you've had working so far with organisations on kind of that governance piece and that change management piece? If you're happy to share, you can give just like one example or if there's oh. something before that's common, feel free to share. <laughs> You, you know, you know the thing that really, really bothers me. Like, you you get a call from a client, and you know you're, you know, they're oh yes, we need to make this happen. You know, this especially, especially um, after Black Lives Matter, right? Yeah. After Black Lives Matter, so many calls from clients. Oh yeah, we need to make a difference. We need to do this. We need to blah 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 blah. And then when you start working with them, you realize that this is not genuine. Mm. This is just, they're just doing this for a tick boxing exercise, right? And it's the same thing with the whole notion of diversity. That's why we don't talk about diversity at our business. We only talk about inclusion and belonging mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. social justice and social value because, mm -hmm. because diversity is a tick box exercise, yeah. right? Yeah, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. You just need to go, just go to any town square and just see a black man and say, hey, Mr. Black man, I pay you 90K, come and work for me. You see a woman and say, hey, Miss woman, I'll give you 90K, come and work for me, right? They're going to show up. That's good money, right? Yeah. But what happened is that when they show up and the, and, and the culture is toxic and the environment they work in is, you know, misogynic and, um, you know, all of that kind, and homophobic and, and yeah. racist, they're not going to stay. Mm. They're not going to stay. So you have to make, my grandfather always says that, you know, make sure you can dance a yard before you can dance abroad. In mm. other words, you know, make sure that your house is in order before you start saying, okay, Miss So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, come and work for me. When your house is in order, you don't even have to do that, you know, you'll attract them. Exactly. This, this is my <laughs> argument consistently. I'm so glad you're reiterating it for me because yeah. so many times, like most people come to, to Diversity Alliance for we want to hire more diversity. Can you help us with our devising our recruitment process and introduce, or just a message going, can you introduce us to um, groups or communities or people? I'm like, man, you've not got Google or LinkedIn. Like, exactly. <laughs> in all honesty, you know? And you also, know I mean? the point is, you should be cleaning house first so that you're, you're attracting you naturally. You need to Show be the work you're house. doing in inclusion. Yeah, community. of course. Show that work you've been doing for for black people, not just in black history month throughout throughout the whole year. Show yeah, the way you're yeah. doing it for LGBTQ community. Yeah. Talk yeah. about this in the open. Then you attract the candidates and retain them, not just by going, we want to hire diverse people, come and join us. Yeah. No, no, yeah. no. Yeah. It's a long I game mean, legacy, you know? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we have given clients back money before because mm -hmm. we recognize that, you know what? I need to sleep in my bed when night comes, mm -hmm. right? I have a content. And uh, this is not what I'm about. Like, yeah. you know, I could make a lot more money if I decided to stay in corporate and yeah. just have a nice cushy job, right? Yeah. And I get hit up, you know, with people on LinkedIn all the time offering me a really nice cushy job. You know, for me, you know, but for me it's about, I don't know how much longer I have left on this earth and I have two kids and I yeah. want to make sure that them and my, my nieces and my nephews and their children can say, you know, you see that tree right there? That was planted by my dad or my granddad. Like, you know, that's what I want to happen. Same. Right? That's exactly you know, that's the same. That's what I want to happen. So, yeah. 
so we only work with companies that are genuine and I, i'm just tired of just seeing you know um you know things of like the tick boxing exercise that's take that that's that's like one of our biggest challenge with working with clients one of the other biggest challenges as well we see is the is um you know especially senior leaders um and and it's probably it's probably yeah it is a challenge mm. especially those who are diversity practitioners like diversity managers and 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 chief diversity officers in businesses is the whole notion of always wanting to just work in these silos there's wow. these silos of orientation ethnicity gender wow. disability right without recognizing that one no one that sits in any of those silos is any one thing exactly right? <laughs> yeah that's one and two you're alienating a whole group of people that you call male stale and pale or whatever they want to call them the straight white male you're alienating an entire group of individuals how the hell can you be alienating a group of individuals who make up the, the most of the management structures yeah. who are the ones that are responsible for making um giving you the resources allocating the resources whether it's budget etc signing off on the policies and the rules etc like you can't alienate them right you know how can you create a, an inclusive culture when yeah. you have a whole bunch of people over here that is not being included right oh, i think to get them on this train with you right I I, I, i'm just it's like it's like trying to pull tools to get them to understand that mm, you've got to get them on board do you know what i feel like i should pay you right now romeo because <laughs> next <laughs> because next month and this is a bit of a plug i guess but you've just happily walked me into it and next month's diversity inclusion um, and belonging focus is on honoring men just honoring men mum so we're going to have four contributors who are going to be speaking on their experiences in the workplace and society now um, and yeah. what their challenges are and the importance yeah. of kind of like you know be, being um, involved in these DEI processes and yes. be heard and listened to yes. because I definitely noticed the same thing as you I was like we are alienating a whole of sector course. of people you know of course. And we need of to hear course. their voices too. If we're going to bring everyone on board and working towards this common goal, everyone needs to be involved. And I agree with you on that one. So I have a question for you because a lot of that yeah. focus is going to be on how how important is being allowing yourself as a man to be vulnerable, or if you identify as a man to be vulnerable in the workplace, but still show strong leadership. So you want to show your can? Is that possible? Is that a thing? If what do you think on that? No, no, ab absolutely. I, I think so. As men, we are we are socialized to think, think that vulnerability is weakness. Mm. As men, we are socialized, especially black men, we're socialized with what I'd like to call toxic masculinity. Right? Men don't cry. Men don't show emotions. Men don't do this. Men should. You should just man up. Mm. Like I, you know, I hate when people tell me that i just need to man up i'm like right now i don't feel like man enough so you know what if you want to think i'm woman enough fine i'm going to woman up right now because i feel tired right you know and and, and so i think that men have that kind of have, have to work on themselves where that is concerned i think i i was able to work through that right mm. um, whereas now i I'm, I'm not afraid to kind of you know tell my team like i don't know yeah i, yeah. I don't know the answer like how can we solve this like you know i'm not afraid to say to my team that you know what i messed up like mm -hmm. we lost that client because i messed up i did something wrong and mm -hmm. i think and, and i'm actually mentoring a senior leader right now and this is one of the things that uh, i mean coaching rather and this is one of the things that he's going through right okay. you know that ego thing of leadership of always mm -hmm. thinking that you have to you have a leader is someone that's tough and resilient and you know have to have make the decisions and know everything and 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 all of that right um you know mm. and, and that's one of the things that i think a lot of men in in leadership um struggle with but mm. but leaders need to understand that vulnerability is not a weakness it's a strength yeah right being and being and and it's because society has kind of painted 
that that whole thing around vulnerability if you look up the real meaning of vulnerability it has nothing to do with weakness or strength it's just being open and transparent and accepting right Mm -hmm. and therefore as leaders as especially as male leaders we need to recognize that being vulnerable with our team is showing them that i understand your pain Mm -hmm. i understand we're going through i can identify with your with your shortcomings i can identify with your quote unquote failures right Mm -hmm. and then and vulnerability is also about you know finding a solution you know, working with that individual or what with that team to find a solution in an open way. You know, not being dictatorial, not thinking that you know everything, but being open to the suggestion, being accepting of those suggestions. And at some point saying, okay, we're going to go with Tom's idea. That's a great idea, guys. Let's run with it. And yeah. providing the resources where that is concerned. So, so, so yes, I, I think that that's one of the things that men... Um, need to deal with it as far as their 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 leadership is concerned women are far better at, at, at mm-hmm. this than, mm-hmm. than men are to be honest with you depending but um, I won't, i'm not going to get into that right now actually because, <laughs> because otherwise we're going to be here till this afternoon so i just want to close up and wrap up our fantastic conversation romeo got one two minutes left for you to just tell us a little bit about what's next for you what's next for you um Lumera, what's what's happening tell us the news I mean, what, what's next for us is that we are we're launching a, a number of um, of pieces of revolutionary technology um, right now um, to build out to build out the offering so that uh, you know we we're very data centric we're very data driven and so we believe that what we find is that lots of leaders like to see you know what's the return on investments for the work that we're doing in this space or they need to be convinced based on the data. You know, yeah. so so we have a number of technology right now. We've developed this really amazing new piece of technology called the ESG taxonomy, which helps companies to build like a dashboard in terms of um, you know their their ESG um, what they want to measure, especially around the S and the G as well, mm-hmm. and and the data will be pulled from their system. They're able to then amalgamate it and and, and create dashboards for reporting and also benchmark against what's happening um, in 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 the in the in with their peers in the wider society. So that's one thing. Right. But but for me as well is just to keep chipping away at the whole notion of of of, of the fact that you know working with businesses who want to make an impact, who really want to make a change, you know, in the world. Um, we also have a foundation called the Ivory Foundation, which was named after my mother and my grandmother. And so we work a lot with young people, especially in rural, in the rural parts of the UK, yeah. um, Ghana. They get and neglected as exactly. well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. And mm-hmm. Jamaica. To, to give them, that's what I said. I just want to open their, their eyes a little bit, just as how my eyes was open a little bit. Yeah. as to what the, what the possibilities are right and mm-hmm. we're, we've been doing some amazing work where that is concerned and you know mm-hmm. i hope even after i retire i can still be able to to kind of do that the, 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 every invoice that we issue from lumerous 10 percent of that goes towards the foundation the mm-hmm. reason why lumerous exists is to fund the foundation and the work that is the, that it does that's that's what it is so for me it's building lumerous you know, make it in a in a in a company that's, that's profitable, so that we can then um, even wider the impact. Because we're, I always say, we're doing two things: we're redefining leadership, both mm-hmm. in the business sphere, but also with young people, right? Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And also, you, I, I'm going to say it on camera and put it out there online because when you say it out there in the ether, it has to happen, right? Yes, and also, yes, you absolutely. Are be working on something as well. Um, you and I are going to be working on something oh, as well. Absolutely. But let's keep that secret. Maybe we'll just have to stay tuned on that one. Yes, stay tuned for that it. one. Stay tuned for that one. And it's going to be amazing. Trust me. Yes.